we're talking about um, carcinomas and mucinous neoplasms of the appendix. It's a delight to have so many people from so many places across the world registered for this, this webinar. And um, I, I look forward to presenting to you a very interesting day. I'd like to welcome the main author of the guideline, Professor Norman Carr, who's going to be doing a short introductory talk around the guidance of the implementation. And then we're going to be judged by the rest of the authors who are involved. They are Dr. Manuel Rodriguez Justo, Dr. Newton Wong, and Professor Roger Feekins. And they will be joining us once Norman has completed his talk. During the course of that, the question and answer button will be open for you. So if you go to the bottom of the screen, a, 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 a Q&A box appears. If you'd like to raise a question, just enter the question in there as we go along, and we'll pick that up at the end. You'll realize that from a large number of questions that we may get from such a large audience, we may not be able to address all of them individually, but we'll do our very best to try to, um, uh, to try to put together as many of the questions as we can. So without further ado, um, I would just like again to welcome uh, Professor Carr and ask him to lead off with the presentation, Norman. Thank you, hopefully you can hear me and I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation. And since time is short, we'll move straight on to the um, to, to just tell you the main areas I'm going to cover, which are the classification of appendiceal neoplasms and pseudomyxoma semiperitoneae, how to grade them, and how to stage them. So, how should we be classifying mucinous tumors of the appendix? Well, this is it. There are four main groups, four main diagnoses, and they're there on the left-hand side of the screen. LAMs, low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms, HAMNs or HAMs or high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, mucinous adenocarcinoma, and mucinous adenocarcinoma with signaturing cells. And the way in which we put a tumor into any one of those four groups is shown in the middle two columns, either by the, it's by the type of invasion and the cytology. If it's got putting invasion, it is low grade or high grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, depending on the cytology. And then if there's infiltrative invasion, that defines adenocarcinoma. So if infiltrative invasion is present, that is by definition um, an adenocarcinoma. An adenocarcinoma with signaturing cells is classified separately because um, that has a worse prognosis. And the WHO grades are shown on the right. G1 is for low grades, but both HAMs and mucinous adenocarcinomas are given a grade of G2. And then G3 is mainly reserved for signaturing cells, although actually a very poorly differentiated mucinous adenocarcinoma with sheets of signaturing cells could also be considered G3. I've got some pictures here to show you what I mean. In the left-hand column, you can see a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm at low power and high power. At low power, you can see the tongues of um, uh, pushing invasion that produce these diverticular-like structures. And at a high power, this is low-grade. Often in lambs, the dysplasia is so low-grade, it scarcely looks dysplastic at all. Ham. It's the next column, and you can see again, it's got pushing invasion. Um, there's no infiltration, but if you use your high power lens, you will see what is distinctly high power cytology. These are unusual um, lesions. Um, most mucinous neoplasms are actually lambs, but as you can see in that image, high grade dependency on mucinous neoplasm, you have almost total loss of polarity, um, crowded nuclei, quite a lot of pleomorphism, there are a lot of mitotic figures, and um, occasionally you can see cribriform structures, but in the appendix, cribriform structures are not needed for high grade, unlike, say, in the colon. Mucinous adenocarcinomas are defined by infiltrative invasion, and that's the same sort of invasion as you would see in any typical colorectal carcinoma with a desmoplastic reaction, angulated glands, tumor budding, and such. Now, I've already mentioned that signaturing cell 
uh, lesions are designated separately. And if more than 50% of the cells are signaturing cells, then you can call them signaturing cell carcinoma if you like. Um, but as I say, if there are more than 10% signaturing cells, then mention them in the report and they will be classified G3 in the WHO classification. non mucinous adenocarcinomas of the appendix also occur. Contrary to what you may read in some of the older literature, they are less common than mucinous neoplasms of the appendix, mucinous adenocarcinomas of the appendix. They are um, generally um, worse prognostically. And the WHO classification now follows uh, a two-tier system for these non mucinous adenocarcinomas, low grade and high grade, as you can see there. I'm not going to say anything much about the precursor lesions. Um, there's no time, um, but uh, just suffice it to say that uh, there are two main types or two main classifications of precursor lesions in the appendix. Uh, the serrated polyp also called sessile serrated lesion and uh, the colorectal type adenoma. And the reason that um, serrated polyps in the appendix actually um, I, I prefer not to call them sessile serrated lesions, actually, because um, they have different genetics, different prognostic implications, different behavior, and I think some different morphology as well. Um, however, it's quite acceptable to call them sessile serrated lesions, if you like. I should say a few words about pseudomyxoma peritonei, because this is the complication that is particularly feared if you have a ruptured mucinous appendiceal neoplasm. The idea is, is that the mucinous uh, tumor cells get into the peritoneal cavity and then spread through it, creating um, mucinous ascites. But nodal and hematogenic metastases are unusual, very unusual, in fact, exceptional in the low-grade form of the disease. And um, as I say, it's a very distinct uh, syndrome. The appendix is the commonest primary, but there are actually other um, primary sites that can occasionally give you pseudomyxoma peritonei. Uh, the uracus is one, for example. The grading of pseudomyxoma peritonei is similar and follows the same sort of principles as for mucinous appendiceal neoplasms, but actually does have some differences. Firstly, if there was just acellular mucin, then you classify that separately. The reason being that if you only find acellular mucin in the peritoneal cavity in a ruptured uh, mucinous appendiceal neoplasm, the prognosis is better. And in fact, that's ungraded in the WHO system. You then have low grade, high grade, and high grade with signaturing cells, which is G1, G2, and G3. And the preferred terminology um, is mucinous carcinoma peritonei. For, uh, for this phenomenon. Um, so, you, so if you have the clinical syndrome of pseudomyxoma peritonei and you find low-grade cells in it, you call it low-grade mucinous carcinoma peritonei, for example. This terminology supersedes other terminology you may have come across, such as adenomucinosis. I've already uh, mentioned, I think, that at least 10% of the cells should be signaturing cells to be classified as such. The reason being, if there are fewer than 10% of cells are signaturing cells, uh, there's a lot of inter-observer variation. Uh, the figure of 10% is pretty arbitrary, though. Also, as pathologists, we need to be aware of pseudo-signets. These are not signaturing cells. They're actually just degenerating cells in mucin pools that have detached themselves from, uh, from the adjacent epithelium. They're not signaturing cells and shouldn't be confused with them. I should also mention briefly that you can have discordant histology. The grade of the appendiceal primary and the peritoneal disease may differ. Now, the prognosis is more dependent on the peritoneal disease. And for this reason, the primary and the peritoneal disease are graded separately. And it's quite clear in the, uh, on the, in the data set on, on the reporting pro forma uh, how to do this. Um, and this is an unusual thing. In most, in most body, body sites uh, in oncology, we don't do this, but we do in the appendix. I just want to talk briefly about staging now. Now, 
the adenocarcinomas and at least currently HAMNs are staged just like colorectal uh, carcinoma. PT1 is involved of submucosa, PT2 muscularis propria, PT3 subserosa, PT4A serosin and mental perforation. LAMNs are currently, we do not use the PT1 and PT2 classification. Instead, if it's confined to the mucosa, sorry, the submucosa and the muscularis propria, we use the term PTIS. This reflects the very low risk of progressive disease if the LAMN does not spread beyond muscularis propria. Having said that, the risk is not zero. Occasionally, um, uh, PTIS LAMNs are associated with pseudomyxoma peritonei, and then we assume that maybe there has been a subclinical rupture previously, which is now healed. A few points about staging. Even a very thin fibrous wall counts for PTIS if there's no evidence of extension into periappendiceal fat. So for example, here, this is, this is significantly less than a millimeter thick, this wall, but actually this lesion here is still PTIS. Acellular mucin counts for PT3 and PT4A. So in this image, you can see that the cells only get as far as the uh, muscularis propria, which is here, and the subserosa and the serosa are involved by acellular mucin, and this is still PT4A. Now, if this serosal mucin has neoplastic cells in it, the prognosis is worse, but that's not captured in the PT classification. Therefore, there is a separate line in the data set uh, for this feature. The PN classification generally follows the colorectal scheme, except that PN2 is not divided into A and B for some reason. Um, we followed the principle of, in TNM8 that tumor deposits or satellites are um, the same in the appendix as the colorectum, but actually this is without any real evidence. And I think that satellites in the context of pseudomyxoma peritonei are impossible to define and probably meaningless. So in pseudomyxoma cases, I, I don't report satellites. Uh, but of course, if you had a non mucinous adenocarcinoma of the appendix, for example, then that might be very relevant. Regarding the PM classification, only cells and mucin beyond the appendix and meso appendix are classified PM1. I mention that in particular because that is a source of confusion sometimes. And the PM categories are very different from the colorectal categories. And that is because in the appendix, the PM categories um, are really designed to follow pseudomyxoma peritonei and its behavior. So if there's acellular mucin only in the peritoneum, it's PM1A, reflecting, as I mentioned a minute ago, the good, uh, relatively good prognosis uh, under such circumstances. If you find epithelial cells in the peritoneal mucin, then that is PM1B. And if there are non-peritoneal metastases, that's PM1C. By non-peritoneal metastases, I mean uh, things like distant nodal spread or spread to the bone marrow or something like that. Um, not, not involvement of the ovary because ovarian involvement is part of the picture of pseudomyxoma peritonei and that would still be included as PM1B and the data set makes this point clear. So, as I mentioned a moment ago, PM1B includes ovarian involvement, omental cake, and invasion of underlying organs via serosal deposits. This actually is a Kuchenberg tumor um, that was removed from a patient with pseudomyxoma peritonei of appendiceal origin. Sometimes the only extra appendiceal neoplastic cells are in the ovary, with any mucin elsewhere in the peritoneal cavity being acellular. This is still PM1B. And as I also mentioned, PM1C should be used to imply hematogenous metastases or non-regional nodal metastases. And so, for example, here's this liver. So here's some pseudomyxoma peritonei on the surface pushing its way into the liver. Um, that's PM1B. But this intrahepatic metastasis that's presumably got there through the bloodstream would be PM1C. A few words briefly about MMR, 
and uh, RAS and BRAF testing. The evidence is scanty in the appendix. We've included them as non-core items in the data set. Although for treatment purposes, oncologists often want to know, especially for high grade and non-mucinous tumors, because those cancers will be treated often uh, with uh, um, uh, chemotherapy. Finally, if there are lots of signaturing cells, consider the possibility of goblet cell adenocarcinoma. And if you hunt around and you find areas with the classical features of goblet cell adenocarcinoma, then that's what it is. It is a goblet cell adenocarcinoma. And then you use the data set in the, um, in the, uh, uh, in, in the other, in the um, neuroendocrine tumor uh, data set, and the link is there on the, at the bottom of the screen. In the future, it is very likely that goblet cell adenocarcinomas will be included actually along with uh, other adenocarcinomas of the appendix in the current data set. Okay, thank you all very much for your attention. That's the end of my presentation. Norman, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> that was very succinct, very understandable, beautiful, thank you. It's a complex area, which I think a lot of us, um, you kind of dread seeing one of these when it comes past and it's very helpful um, to be elucidated like that. Um, but before we, just while people are, are thinking of questions to ask, just take a moment to say this is, um, a part of the college work that people don't often see. It's part of the infrastructure of pathology practice that clinical effectiveness in the college does so well. And I really just want to take a moment to thank Maria Marrero Feo and Cheryl Marasigan, who are responsible for doing all of this in the college. People often ask, what does the college do for us? It's a bit like the, 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 the scene in the life of Brian where um, they ask, what do the Romans do for us? Well, this is the sort of the thing that the college does for us. It provides us with the ways to solve difficult clinical questions and problems. And as vice president for professionalism, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to see that happening. So thank you all very much for the work that goes in underneath. Uh, and of course, for the people who are recruited to do the hard work of producing the guidelines. So thanks again to all of you. In terms of questions, the first question that we have available is round about um, recordings of this, this session. And we will be putting it on the website as it stands, um, edited so that we take out all the ums and ahs that are mine. And we'll have um, that available in a couple of weeks or so, which will be available to members and fellows on the website. Someone's asked if we can have just the presentation. I'm not sure about that, but perhaps we can discuss that and um, it's the, the, the presentation, of course, is, is Norman's to decide. So looking through the questions we've got so far, and thank you very much for those, and do keep them coming. We, we have a question about grading, which I guess is not going to be a surprise, Norman. Um, oh, before we go further, can I please also introduce the rest of the panel? So um, Dr. Rodriguez Justo, Dr. Newton Wong, and Dr. Roger Feek, uh, Professor Roger Feekins should now all come on screen so we can be seen. And um, uh, how this works, uh, everyone, is that the question is asked and then uh, Norman will uh, answer the question or will delegate to one of the co-authors who will pick it up as we go along. So um, the first question really is about grading. And if we find uh, an LAMN in the appendix, and at the same time, high-grade mucinous carcinoma um, in the peritoneum. How do we handle that? What's the what's what's the what's the uh, the, the route we take to trying to solve that problem? Norman, do you want to answer that? Sorry, I was on mute. That's yes, right. I can. I can answer that one. That actually. Um, if you follow the if you follow the the, the, the data set through, um, it should guide you through that. What you do is you classify them separately. So it's an LAMN, then it is high grade mucinous carcinoma peritonei, and the overall grade is the higher of the two grades. So the appendix is G1, the peritoneal disease is G2, and the overall grade is G2. Um, now this is something that we it is, it's not rare. We get this discordant histology probably in about three and a half percent of our 
cases here at Basingstoke. I don't know, um, Roger Newton, do you have any experience of this? Yeah, there was that case um, which I discussed with you as well, Norman. You might you might recall. If anything, what was interesting was that the discordance was the other way around, in that there was high grade dysplasia in the appendix hamin, uh, whereas the only um, viable epithelium neoplastic wise was in the ovary, and that was low grade. Um, so yeah, we definitely say it's rare, and it can even be the other way around, which seems counterintuitive uh, biologically. I, I just wonder. Is, is it, I mean, we have to classify them, but is it very important in terms of management that there's a discordance? I mean, what do you think, Norman? Does it really matter? We're documenting it precisely, but we have to go on what's there. Yes, we do. Um, the reason it does matter is that it's the peritoneal disease that is most important. Yes, yes. So, yes. so, hmm. so that's right. So, um, uh, so actually, we've, we've recently published the, on this uh, showing that um, survival is related more to the peritoneal disease than, 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 than the independent cell primary, which is why we do this, which you don't in other organs, you know, in other organs in the body, we don't do this. But it's probably something to do with the peculiar nature of, perit of pseudomyxoma peritonei, which is, a, which is almost unique in oncology. Um, and uh, we often assume that if the disease is worse than the peritoneum, it's because there's been um, that new mutations have occurred and it's and, and it's sort of progressed down the, the, the tumor pathway. Sometimes we see um, after chemotherapy, the grade reduces, for example. So what was high grade becomes subsequently becomes low grade. But anyway, it's a, it's a it's a big field in its own right. I won't go on about it too much. It's a it's an interesting area, but time is short, so I won't. Uh, I won't dilate too much on that. Thank you. We're also being asked about the differentiation between high-grade neoplasia and mucinous adenocarcinoma. And with that, there's a question about mucin pooling in the wall of the appendix. What's the relationship of that in, in the business of trying to grade these lesions? Okay, acellular mucin pools in the wall of the appendix can be seen in all grades, including low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. So if you see um, acellular mucin within the wall of the appendix, that doesn't help you grade it. Um, I think, I think that, was the, that was one aspect of the question. What is the, what is the, what is the other aspect of the question? The other piece is about trying to differentiate between a high-grade um, appendiceal mucinous neoplasm and uh, mucinous adenocarcinoma. Yes, I think the, 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 the key is the type of invasion. So if it's so if at low power you think oh that's just pushing invasion, then if at high power you then see high grade cytology, it's a high grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. But if you then if at low power you're looking at the lesion and think this looks like an adenocarcinoma because of the infiltrative invasion, then then that's then that's what it is. Um, I don't know I don't know if my colleague can sort of explain that a bit more clearly. I think it was clear, yeah. Okay. Just, just a follow-on from that, Norman, is, is just about the presence of um, signet ring cells floating in mucin pools. Now, I know you mentioned earlier the bit about degenerate cells, and I guess we've got macrophages to contend with as well. But assuming that we can demonstrate that they are signet ring cells, and I guess from my experience, immunocytic chemistry can be tricky around about that, but I just wonder what your thoughts are. With immunos, they would only be useful in distinguishing um, uh, macrophages from epithelial cells. So that might, that might be helpful in that respect. But once you've identified them as epithelial cells, it's up to you and your professional judgment. And do these things look like degenerating cells that have detached themselves from, a, from, from, um, from an adjacent uh, mm -hmm. uh, strip of epithelium? Or do they look like genuine um, uh, signet ring cells that are f floating in pools of mucin in the infiltrative pattern that has, actually has its own name, the small cellular mucin pool pattern of infiltration. Um, and sometimes it's very difficult, you know. Um, it's just I, a question I, I of agree. judgment. I, I agree entirely with that. I would say it's a matter of judgment as it is in most parts of the gastrointestinal mm. tract. Unfortunately, it's one of the most difficult areas that we encounter mm. as GI pathologists. Um, and I think your presentation made it clear that overcalling is probably what we are trying to avoid, isn't it, Norman? Yes. Okay, thank you. There's been some questions about prognosis, and I think you mentioned the relationship between serrated adenomas and conventional adenomas, um, and then um, 
is, is there a prognostic significance if we can identify what the origin of, of a lesion is? And again, um, is molecular technology helpful um, in determining how these things will, will, will work out for the patient? These are, this is a very interesting area, um, and I could go on about it at some length, but the short answer is, at the moment, there is no known significance. Um, whether, the, whether the precursor lesion looks like, um, looks like a serrated adenoma, or looks like a tubulovillus adenoma, or a combination of the two, or a sessile serrated lesion, or often all of them together, Often you can see a, 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 a spectrum, a, a, a continuum from a serrated polyp type thing to a serrated polyp type thing with dysplasia to a LAMN to an HKMN and then an invasive adenocarcinoma. I have actually seen all of them in the same appendix. And um, what that means, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, uh, there may well be prognostic implications. And as we learn more about the genetics of these things, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll work them out. But at the moment, we don't know. Yeah, I was just going to echo what uh, Norman said. And perhaps that uh, wide spectrum of change you've seen, Norman, is similar to what we see in the right colon, where we see serrated sessile lesions progressing through dysplasia and then into cancer. Mm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. Uh, th th there are also questions about, about the, the relationship or the diagnosis of uh, the, the determination of how we sort out between appendiceal and other primaries that cause pseudomyxoma peritonei. And for example, if we find a low-grade lesion in the appendix, but pseudo we, we mentioned this already in terms of the grading, but um, if, if the grading differs, should we necessarily be thinking about looking for something elsewhere, like ovary or colon, as a source for, um, for the, the pseudomyxoma? In my view, not if the clinical picture fits pseudomyxoma peritonei. I mean, by all means, you know, every, every case needs working up properly. I mean, every case um, that we get uh, will always have a colonoscopy, for example, to make sure there's no, nothing synchronous going on in the colon. Mm -hmm. There will be full radiological workup. Um, but if it looks like pseudomyxoma peritonei of appendiceal origin, um, I don't go hunting for a new primary immunohistochemically. I just assume that's, that's what the position is. I don't know, Newton, Roger, if, if you have, a, have a, an opinion on how to approach it. Sounds very reasonable to me, Norman, what you just said, yes. I agree. Okay, thank you very much. And in terms of differentiating between metastatic ovarian carcinomas, I guess you know you, you you've got a range of antibodies that you would use for you know for ovarian for differentiating ovarian and um, and a GI pathology metastatic in the peritoneum you know, on cytology, I guess this is, are the same, the same panel of antibodies useful in this context? Um, yes and no. They're as useful as they are anywhere else, but often that means they're not very useful. Uh -huh. That's what I mean. Okay. I mean, it, to be frank, if you have a mucinous tumour of the ovary, the own and you and you are suspecting that, you know, and, and the clinical picture is pseudomyxoma peritonei, then until you've looked at the appendix, you can't be certain it's not come from the appendix. The exception is ovarian teratomas, because often they will produce a mucinous tumor that is identical to an ovarian, uh, to, to, to an appendiceal lesion. This is because it's not an ovarian lesion at all. It's actually an appendiceal tumor that has arisen within a teratoma of the ovary. Mm -hmm. Again, Newton and Roger, I don't know if you, if you have any comments on immunos in this context. I was just going to say that, um... Uh, you're sort of implying the starting points when you see pseudomyxoma should be that it's probably appendiceal, uh, which it's just briefly, I mean, some time ago when I started my career, we assumed that all these lesions were coming from the ovary, all these pseudomyxoma peritonei, and that's not that long ago. I'm not ancient. so mm. um, I remember that, that too. Be... <laughs> I was there too. Yes, yes, yes. And now I think the starting point, well, I know the starting point is, is appendix. And even when you, as you say, you see something in the ovary, 
it's sort of reasonably likely it's come from the appendix in the context of seizure myxoma, even if it looks like an ovarian tumor. I think that's what I would. Yes. Yeah, uh, apologies, I'm gonna have to leave to, to attend a correct on appendiceal MDT, but that's a big bugbear of mine. I mean, uh, from a biological point of view, you know, a cancer cell has all the genetic machinery to differentiate any way it wants. So if it differentiates, despite the fact it starts in the ovary along intestinal lines, there's no way we can tell from uh, immunist chemistry whether it's come from the ovary or the appendix. So I completely agree, you know, when it comes down to it, despite the fact our clinicians pester us time and time again, you know, is it mucinous ovarian of intestinal type or is it a primary intestinal? I keep saying we can't tell. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Newton, and just let me take the opportunity to thank you for your contribution, not only to this, but to the construction of the guideline. Much appreciated. An excellent piece of work, and thank you very much. Enjoy your MDT. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> just so we can carry on, there are some, some questions uh, which are really of a practical nature around about blocking and levelling. Um, if we find an appendiceal lesion such as you've been describing what would be your your guidance as to the blocking strategy and then levels and and how, how would you investigate these lesions um, ideally if you have a mucinous tumor in the appendix the gold standard is to all process the appendix um, i don't bother with levels unless they're particularly indicated but certainly to all process the appendix so that you can look for high grade areas or foci of infiltrative invasion, which would obviously affect the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the prognosis. If you have an enormous mucosal um, and it looks exactly the same throughout, to be quite frank, I, I think that you could use your professional judgment on exactly how much you sample, but you should sample it widely. Um, and then if you have pseudomyxoma peritoneae, then there is no, there, it's a rare disease. There are no actual guidelines. Um, we have published a small series on this saying that if you have, if you find acellular mucin only in the peritoneum and you haven't all processed the mucin, it's worth going back and taking a bit more mucin. Yeah. Um, but, but no more than 30 extra blocks because then, then you're just wasting your time probably. Sure, yeah. I just, um, just in terms, of, you used the term mucosal there, and there's been a couple of questions about whether that is an appropriate term. So clearly, you believe it is, and I, I guess the the question is, um, or the, the other piece of that is that when you see these things, in in certainly in, in my limited experience of them, you tend to find there is a lesion further proximal in the appendix, which is responsible for obstructing it and producing the mucosal. Uh, <clears throat> so you, presumably you then, under those circumstances, you need to be very careful about sampling the piece um, proximal to that mucosal. Yes, you're right. The term mucosal as such just means a dilated mucin-filled appendix. And you're right, you shouldn't use it if there's any, if there's any going to be any, and it's certainly not a histological diagnosis. Sure. Um, but you can call something an inflammatory mucosal or a retention cyst, as you say, if there's an obstruction proximally and it's all inflamed and a bit sort of, you know, um, uh, degenerate looking distally. That is actually, in my view, very rare. Most large dilated mucin filled appendices, especially if they're two centimeters or more diameter, if you look hard enough, you'll find LAMN. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> There's another question which is similar to some we've had, but slightly different. You described when you were when you were talking about the histology of these lesions, the, the kind of tongues or diverticular appearances. Um, when in a very low grade lesion, how do you differentiate is one of the questions between what is a low grade lesion and um, just a straightforward diverticulum, especially when there's a degree of inflammation round about that. I mean, to me, it would be around the stroma, perhaps, but I'm just, I'm just curious as to what you say. This actually is worth a, a lecture in its own right, because mm -hmm. it is the most common problem I get in my personal referral practice. Is this a ruptured diverticulum, or is it a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm? And it is often very, very difficult. There are a few papers out there that, 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 that can help. But to, um, but to summarize it, if there's retention of lamina propria, 
if there's a characteristic pattern of crypt disarray without any obvious features of LAMN, then that can be a ruptured diverticulum. Roger, what else should I be mentioning? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I thought maybe you say obvious features of LAMN. So if there is obvious epithelial atypia, and we're talking mm -hmm. about mild atypia mm -hmm. uh, initially, mm -hmm. then perhaps push us towards LAMN. The problem also, of course, with that is that a diverticulum, like anything, can become ulcerated. Mm. And then you could have atypical epithelium in the diverticulum. I think the first sentence of your answer is, is, is again, I, I always agree with this, is to admit that it's not easy. Mm. And anyone who thinks it's easy is probably wrong. And anyone who tries hard to find the right answer, admitting it's not easy, is probably doing the right thing. So there have been a few papers. And I've noticed that the threshold for deciding it might be uh, I think there was some enthusiasm for saying, if in doubt, call it an LAMN. And I think we've gone down a little bit from that point of view and saying, no, that was perhaps a little bit too liberal. Mm. We get a lot of LAMNs if we do that. So I think knowing where to set the threshold between the two, uh, I mean, you're the expert, you see so many of these, but I find it very difficult. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I really like the, I really empathize with your comment, Roger, about the fact that folks say, who, who tell you that difficult things are easier, best <laughs> kept at arm's length. I think it's, um, if, well, if, you know, if we find stuff difficult, that probably means it's difficult rather than anything I, else. And I <laughs> should very briefly say there was a picture in a book by Bob Riddell, a famous GI pathologist, looking at pseudo-invasion and sigmoid polyps versus carcinoma and saying there are some cases you cannot classify. And I think sometimes yeah. we have to admit we can't do it. And this is an example. I don't think we should we should say we can't do all of them, but you know, mm -hmm. it's the occasional case which is difficult. And referral to Norman would be quite a good idea in these circumstances. <laughs> Sorry, Norman, I've probably increased your <laughs> referral now by a hundred cases well, a year. <laughs> that piece of discussion actually covers a question that that came up about the differentiation of what, when does something pushing become invasion, or um, but it, it's the same. You, you, you've covered that sort of nicely, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, as we near the end, th there is a question which is asking, what, what is it that's in these guidelines that's different from the 2017 version? Um, the, 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 this, these, this is the first guidelines on the appendix, uh, on mucinous tumors, the appendix that, that, that has appeared. So yeah. um, I don't know, there, there has been for goblet cell uh, adenocarcinomas, of course, um, but, this, but these ones are, these mucinous appendiceal tumor ones are new. I think there was a review in histopathology, Norman, which was covering, oh, that you're talking about, and, oh. uh, and they were wondering if we'd changed anything from that. Oh, God, I don't think uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> um, so I think uh, we're we're kind of beginning to um, run through similar questions um, again. One of them, it's a, again, it's a Kind of theme that's coming through is about when we've got pseudomyxoma peritonei, how do we pin the appendix as the primary? I mean, okay, you know, that's, okay. That's a, it's a tricky area, I know. It is. But for, okay, firstly, I would say, firstly, if you have the clinical picture of pseudomyxoma peritonei, assume it could be the appendix. And unless it's been proven not to be the appendix, you can't be certain. The only way you can prove it is to take out the appendix and look at it and look at it properly. Even if the, especially gynecologists who don't like taking out appendices for some reason, if the gynecologist or a surgeon says, oh, the appendix looked normal, that does not exclude the possibility of an LAMN, even a ruptured LAMN, because it might have ruptured previously and sealed. And we see this a lot. We see, we see, they say, oh, we don't know where the pseudomyxomas come from, but we left the appendix behind. They come here to Basingstoke, we take out the appendix, and there's the LAMN. You know, um, so I think that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that um, if you don't have the appendix for some reason, or if the appendix was taken out, um, you know, 50 years previously or something, then each case just needs to be judged in its own merits. Can I just, can I just say a slightly, slightly different point is that cancer of unknown primary, we, all, we experience those as pathologists. We, some of us have to go to a cancer of unknown primary meeting. And sometimes it doesn't occur to us or to clinicians or radiologists that it could be from the appendix, this cancer of unknown primary. So we go through the rigmarole of excluding the usual sites. Then suddenly the radiologist said, oh, the appendix looks a bit strange. 
and actually that turns out to be the site. So um, slightly different point, but hmm. people don't yes. always think of the, think of the appendix hmm. straight away uh, when they have adenocarcinoma, straightforward adenocarcinoma hmm. as, a, as a metastasis. Yeah, okay. Well, I think, um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we've kind of run out of time and I apologize because there are questions that keep coming in. Um, and, uh, but I, I think, I hope we've covered the main areas of these. As I say, we, we're, we're hoping that um, we, we will be hosting this, this presentation, which is why it's been recorded. We'll be hosting it on the RCPATH website and that will be available for everybody to log in in a, in a couple of weeks or so. Um, we can continue the discussion round about the guideline. And I think one of the things that we're going to try and do with these um, sessions is to encourage discussion. There are, there are two good reasons for this. First of all, it provides the writers of the guidelines with feedback as to how applicable they are in, in practice. Because clearly, clearly they're written by experts, but they're going to be applied by people like me who are not experts. And so it's very helpful for us to be able to say, well, we're finding difficulty with this bit. Can you, can you look at that for the next edition? So that's a helpful way forward for the development of a guideline. And secondly, we can perhaps identify people who would be willing to participate in guideline writing, which is from Maria uh, uh, and, um, and Cheryl's point of view, quite a major task is getting people who will volunteer their time to complete these, these really quite demanding tasks of guideline writing. So that really just leaves me to thank everybody again. So Norman uh, Newton, who's left, and Roger for continuing um, the discussion, and Manuel, who I don't seem to think has been able to join us. But thank you all very much indeed, first of all, for the huge amount of work that's gone on in the construction of the guideline and for a very interesting and stimulating presentation and a, a full and helpful discussion afterwards. I can tell you that from the, the feedback that's come in so far, several people have said that it's a very helpful um, discussion with very useful at a practical level in terms of being able to report these conditions. So thank you all very much. The college is intending to continue this series of webinars. We don't have any immediately scheduled, but watch this space because there'll be more emerging in future. And as we go forward, I think we're finding that we get really a lot of people. I mean, we had 660 people registered yesterday for, for this webinar, which is an amazing number. And we're clearly reaching to people across the world to help um, with the improvement of the quality of pathology reporting. And that's something that as the college, we really are trying to do. So um, we will be continuing this in due course and we look forward very much to having our colleagues from across the UK and the rest of the world joining us for those, um, for those webinars. So thank you all very much and have a good day. <laughs>